Welcome to the ProfServe Traction Podcast, dedicated to exploring how professional services and technology businesses break through the ceiling. Here's your host, Steve Prada. All right, so uh, great, uh, good day, uh, listeners. This is Steve Prada with the ProfServe Traction Podcast, and I have with me today Joe Sekala, who is the founder and CEO of the Dream Exchange, which is an innovative new stock exchange for emerging companies. Prior to founding the Dream Exchange, he was uh, the CEO of Expansion Founding Partners, an M&A advisor firm in Chicago. Uh, before that, he was an attorney working on capital raising and M&A deals uh, with Sakala Law Offices, also in Chicago. And Joe graduated from Loyola University in uh, accounting, and he got his law degree from DePaul University College of Law. So welcome to the show, Joe. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. That's great to have you. So uh, please tell me, Joe, how does one become from an attorney, uh, a stock exchange founder, owner, CEO? So, uh, yeah, the, the, the tra- transition of my life. So um, my, my experience in the capital markets uh, really provided a lot of the input, but um, stock exchange specifically is um, I, I was one, the lawyer for the founders of, of what became Archipelago. Um, and Archipelago was the first company to really utilize the internet to trade equity securities. And uh, it became really the best and fastest platform to do that. Um, today, the world knows Archipelago as Nice Arca. It, it merged with the New York Stock Exchange 10 years after I was uh, helping found it. And uh, my former client, Jerry Putnam, became chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. So. It's a little obscure. There are only seven stock exchanges that exist in the country today. So it's not every day that a person is there to create or be at the founding of the stock exchange. So I have that experience. It's it's quite unique. And I use that throughout my career as the backdrop for creating what is now the dream exchange. I I use my law practice in in, uh, small capital deals. And I use my M&A advisory firm to do the research for eventually trying uh, my hand at creating a second stock exchange, which we're in formation now. Well, that's very interesting. And particularly, I I personally am very curious about this because I started life uh, as an M&A advisor as well. And I, uh, you know, I've uh, spent a lot of time uh, wrecking my brains how I could get mid cap companies onto the stock exchange. And London had uh, a program for smaller companies, but even that was prohibitively expensive for like mid cap companies under hundred million dollars. Um, I wonder how that, how that, how, how you found a way to do that. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's so there's, there's two uh, parts to that question. One is exactly right. What are the barriers that exist to uh, a smaller and emerging company going to the public capital markets to get capital or to get liquidity after they're successful. Small companies um, were historically in the United States the most favored IPO. So mm-hmm. there's the research. Our, our research showed that we were, first we had to disco- discover whether there was in fact a problem. And the research showed that between 70 and 90% of all IPOs before 2001 were $50 million and under. And by 2003, we were having fewer than five. If we had 10 in one year, maybe 2% of the market. So something happened to the market. And, and we researched that extensively to, to discover that the, the cost and the cost prohibition really relates to the intermediaries, the investment mm-hmm. banks, the brokers, because they can't make any money on the small transactions any longer because there isn't a sufficient amount of trading volume. So unless you're a billion dollar company, an IPO public capital market is not very interested in you. Even even 500 million is, you're gonna experience an enormous amount of of price suppression or underpricing of the security. So smaller deals have gone away. And then the second part really was that interested me most is the fact that um, in the public capital markets, there are very good companies that are small that go public because they can they can finance their way through the expense and the burden of going through the public offering because it's worth it to them. 
the increased value in public liquidity is worth it to them. Mm -hmm. What I did was I took my M&A practice research and the capital markets research, and I merged it together so that we can streamline the IPO uh, application process. And we can use the tools, the new tools like direct public offerings to reduce the cost and to reduce the banking fees. And uh, we're, we're in a niche market where there are a lot of small market M&A advisors, broker dealers, service professionals who would welcome the opportunity for a brand new type of, of exchange. So having done all that research, we really went and, and worked very hard to lobby for a brand new law. I can get into that a bit later, but that's really the research we did. Actually, our research is published in Oxford University's handbook on IPOs. It's chapter nine. And, wow. uh, right. It's called Low Visibility Markets Acting as Stepping Stones to National Exchanges. And what we, in the research, we discovered there are absolutely clear characteristics of the small firm that will indicate that it will have a success in an IPO and in a public market. And that we hand gathered over 1,600 uh, transactions to put markers on the success of, of the firms. So we know what the data is. We're, we're kind of driven that way. Um, we have a director of research who's a tenured professor at the University of Wisconsin. He's, he's well known, his name is Professor Ionis Floros. He, he lectures globally. And that's really what gave birth to this idea was to really help create a market structure that could invigorate the small capital transaction and like yourself to, to get the intermediaries and the advisors excited about doing it so that the willingness to pay the fee and that's, you know, it's not so much that the fee is there as it isn't worth it to go through the trouble because the valuation and the amount of liquidity and the amount of regulatory reporting, well, you're, it hasn't been worth it. And now with the new formation of this marketplace, when we streamline and we use financial technology to make it cheaper and faster, um, we're definitely, there's an enormous reach um, in the marketplace right now for, for what we're offering. I so, so how much how much cheaper? I mean, I think a, a public offering uh, on in the New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq it can be somewhere like seven twelve percent of the proceeds right. of the offering. So, what are the cost of what what would be the cost on a Dream Exchange IPO? So, the the the, the major price reduction in a fifty million dollar uh, transaction is where the exchange listing fees. So, we can control that from the exchange level. But because of the way we're organizing the process, I think we're going to be around four and a half to five percent of the overall transaction. So significantly lower um, because there is less. Most people consider there to be the same amount of work in a fifty million dollar transaction as a five hundred million dollar transaction. But there is less work to do. There may not be less risk att attached to the security. Okay, in fact, there may be more but that isn't going to be mitigated by doing more work. It's going to be mitigated by identifying the firm that can succeed in advance, which is what we're doing. We're, we're really targeting a, a, a certain audience that we know with a proper amount of due diligence and corporate governance and transparency and reporting and all the things that go into it at more nominal fees, we can accomplish a successful larger public marketplace for small cap companies. That's the goal. But would that work like a private placement uh, for, you know, for just uh, for registered investors or, or you know, high, high, uh, high net worth investors, or would that be uh, available for the public at large to invest? So the in the, so there's a, there's a brand new uh, law called the main street growth act. And in that law, there's the creation of a brand new type of exchange like our exchange called the venture exchange mm -hmm. and a new type of security called the venture security. In those securities, there will be four different trading tiers on our exchange. At the bottom trading tier, uh, there will be a limited ability for non-accredited investors to invest because they will be 
earlier stage, smaller capital raises, more uh, akin to angel investing and accredited investors. The second tier up will be much, it'll look a lot, a lot like the regulation A plus investing where the broad investing public is permitted to invest. The key to this is that bottom tier, now the other two trading tiers are, are exactly normal public offerings, okay? Although smaller and with specialized rules on the bid offer spread, on the timing of the auctions, about on the tick. There's a, an entire set of rules that are built into the law that allow us to accommodate the small company and really reduce fees and create liquidity. The bottom tier for the, for the uh, I, I wanna call it the regulation A plus type security. The real benefit to that bottom trading tier is there's instant liquidity. There's actual capital market liquidity. So when they raise their money in a Reg A plus offering and they, let's say they raise $50 million, well, there's a, a substantial lack of liquidity for that initial investment in a private placement. Whereas if it's a venture security, it will have exactly the same type of public liquidity available in the public capital markets with certain protective rules for the investors and certain enhanced reporting requirements for the company to, be, uh, to have the privilege of getting up the national marketplace to buy and sell your stock. So that's what's in this new law. It's a very exciting new law. I hope that wasn't too complicated for the for the audience, but um, that that's really the the nuts and bolts of the tiers that are built into the Main Street Growth Act. So, so when you're saying uh, the documentation, so the documentation is it more complex for the small companies to basically provide more information to uh, put the public at ease of of the risks, or is it? Uh, reduced, so it's it's a lighter documentation. So it is. It's a lighter documentation, and it phases in increases in the reporting and documentation as the company goes to a broader market. Mm -hmm. Got it. So, so for example, if you're only raising five million dollars and you're at the lowest tier, and it's angel investors and accredited investors, they're going to get the same information that they would get if they invested privately as publicly. So there's not a full requirement to do an S1 securities offering. But after you graduate and more of the investing public, the general public is available to, to invest in that security, then the reporting requirements are increased until they can graduate, like our research, mm -hmm. the low visibility market. And as we incubate them and grow them, they can become more compliant with the full securities laws and it's worth it to spend the money because now they're in a marketplace where the liquidity and the enhanced capital yeah. investing is, is available to them. So, uh, so how is it going to be different at the lower tiers than a private placement? How are you going to generate more liquidity for these offerings? So be, because it is a, um, it's an actual stock exchange. So, um, you know, it's, we're not a private equity firm. We don't have a, a closed list of investors. So it will be a, a listed security on a stock exchange, meaning that every brokerage that has a qualified account will be able to actually see the transaction. So today, if you want to raise money in, amongst angel investors, well, you can't reach all of the angel investors in the country. You're reaching a relationship-driven pool of, of private investors. If you're listed on the exchange, the liquidity is there because the entire American investing public will now have access to your small company. So the liquidity will follow. If you're a good company, you'll have liquidity. This is not you know, a design to prevent all losses. People will invest and some companies won't do well. Uh, on the other hand, the investing public will be making the choice. Uh, it, it offers a freedom of, of choice and opportunity and access to companies that the ordinary investor really at an early stage doesn't really get the opportunity to see uh, an opportunity to invest in. You know, Facebook before Facebook was public wasn't offered to everyone. <laughs> well, essentially, what you're doing is you're making private placements public. Correct. 
in a, in a quasi environment because it's a brand new type of security called a venture security. So it's not the standard type of security. It's a different uh, in between sort of, of uh, hybrid because it's not private because the, it, it will grow and, uh, and more investors are available. It's also not fully public to the extent that um, without full reporting, certain investors at the lowest tier will, will not be able to, to avail themselves. But the second it meets minimum requirements of its market capitalization, its revenues, its growth, it will automatically move to the next tier and be available okay. to the general public. And then, so they ultimately graduate and then the next quarter, they will have to submit a more involved uh, report? That's correct. That's correct. And we have training processes. This is the important the tools we're already using today, even before we're open. Um, we have educational tools that prepare them for the type of, of financial forecasting and earnings reports and, and um, management discussion and analysis reporting that is the demand on a public company that most private companies don't have familiarity with. The CEO is busy developing the company. He's not going to become a securities professional. We're taking care of that. We're there to help them because the, the more successful companies, obviously the bigger our exchange. Um, so it is a very unique brand new paradigm shift in the way, it, it may not be for everyone. I, there's often, I get into discussions where everyone wants to fit some new company into this box. Not every company will want to do this. Some companies will want to remain private. Some companies will want a full public offering. But there's a, we, we already know by survey that there's an enormous population. There's probably, um, uh, that, that we can target, there, there may be as many as a million, 1.3 million companies in the United States that, are, that would be eligible, okay? We only need a couple thousand, <laughs> okay? Um, so, you know, a very small percentage is, all, they're already interested. Interestingly enough, is another kind of a branch of this question. We've received extremely favorable responses from hedge funds, venture capital uh, portfolios, and private equity portfolios because they have good companies. Mm -hmm. Many of those companies, they would have to sell the entire portfolio or the entire company. And this offers them an opportunity to recapture some of their liquidity with their successes, reinvest in their fund, and simultaneously bridge a gap towards a, a public offering that they may have to wait five or seven years longer to experience. Mm -hmm. So it's a very it's been very favorably received. Um, the American uh, Venture Capital Association actually testified in congressional hearings saying we think this is a great idea. Um, many private equity firms have approached us. There are uh, incubators of, of, um, of VC money that have come and said, we have 500 companies in our incubator. We can see 200 of them being immediate listings. So very interesting. liquidity, it, it's, it's liquidity that does not exist in the market. So um, that, that's I, guess, I guess it will also allow the private equity funds to value their portfolio because if there's a public... A quotation yep. for the stock, then it's much easier to value these companies and probably value higher. Precisely, precisely. So do you feel like this could create a competition for private equity funds? Because right now um, at you know, lower levels of the market, it is either them or trade buyers who mm -hmm. can potentially buy these companies. But if, if I can take them and do an IPO and maybe keep control, don't have to recapitalize with the private equity fund, don't have to give up control, I could just uh, do a minority offering and take some chips off the table? Yes, I, th there'll be a, th there will be a percentage of companies that uh, will, it will be a one-to-one -one direct competition for um, the successful company that ordinarily doesn't have a large enough capitalization or valuation to go public and really has only one market to go to. They have to sell to a private equity uh, buyer so yeah, that, there will be a sliver of what we're doing that is competitive that way. It, it may not necessarily be as competitive because a lot of those firms, and we've talked to many firms, I've 
it's, it's 14 years of research. Many of those firms are in a life cycle where they would actually prefer to cash out. They would rather sell to the private equity firm. And so, um, but, you know, for a long time, the, what they call dual track IPO private equity, yep. uh, the, we, would, we would definitely provide a certain amount of um, access to bringing them along on that dual track to find out valuation and they'll either exit or they'll they'll go venture. So we're hoping that the, the nomenclature will be not go public, but do a venture offering. So yeah, I, I think that's going to be a phenomenon. Uh, it's a brand new marketplace. You know, we, we'll find out. <laughs> that's interesting. So what is the ideal uh, size? You mentioned the $50 million company would cost them about 5%, 4.5 to 5%, 2.5 million. Mm -hmm. So is this kind of a fixed amount that it will cost to list there. So this is kind of below 20, 30 million. It's going to still be prohibitive. What is your I, expectation? I, I think our, our really the, the majority of the, this tier will be uh, between 20 and $50 million offerings. And we're expecting that uh, commensurate valuations. In other words, um, because of the small size and the usually the people who want to do this need the liquidity, they need capital, and they're hoping for a, a, a higher valuation. So I suspect the valuations to be somewhere between 60 and 150 million. Uh, so they're, because the entrepreneur wants to hold his own securities yet get liquidity. So the ownership structure is likely to give them the liquidity without having to relinquish um, you know, so much of a dilutive effect as they would in a, in, a, in a traditional VC or private equity transaction. So they can hold on to a bit more of their own creativity and wealth and, and harvest their wealth for themselves a little bit better. So if you say 60 to 160 million valuation is I think what you said. So in terms of EBITDA uh, terms or net profit, uh, what kind of multiples do you expect here? So would so, that be a 60 million? Would that be an eight to $10 million profit company? Hold, or? On, hold on to your seat. So we actually, <laughs> um, we have our internal measurements on valuation in that market. And very often we may have um, negative or, or zero multiples because you know, and I've been using the model like with Tesla Motors didn't didn't have EBITDA in, uh, until second quarter of last year, but they've you know the, they're the largest electronic or the largest auto manufacturer in the world. So what we're looking for are are the companies that, and many of these have historically actually gone public. For example, the biopharma industry, uh, they'll do a public offering. They have no earnings. Some of those companies are in phase two trials at the FDA mm -hmm. in the hope that they're going to be a billion dollar valuation. They go to the public markets, they raise money, they have no EBITDA, they have no earnings. All they have is capital in and capital out. So I think that we're going to see a, a, a large percentage of companies that are beyond the startup phase. They, are, they may actually be in a sales development, but they're not yet profitable. Now, in terms of, of the multiples we do expect on, on earnings of these situations, um, it will be significantly higher than your traditional multiple. So even if you, for example, uh, you know, when WebEx, they, they, they sold and they became the platform for Skype, they, they, they didn't have EBITDA. They had 100 million in sales. They sold for 32 times their sales. So the alternative valuation, you know, $3.2 billion for a company that really wasn't profitable. But the use of the technology for another firm is, is so tremendously valuable that they can go in a public setting and look at a comparable earnings multiple and see, ah, this is a creative value. And the longer the company's able to sustain its capital and the longer we offer those opportunities to the general marketplace, the more the average investor can experience the expanded wealth. So what's far more 
important is the, the increase in valuations by meeting milestones than meeting earnings expectations. That's really how the traditional early stage company gets all of its investors. We're just doing it in a, in a public setting. Um, I do expect multiples to be significantly higher, um, you know, and, 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 and earnings multiples. I love the, I love the platform, the pitch book platform. They're a wonderful database and they're very accurate. They capture most of the private equity market and they come out with their quarterly multiples as to what's happening. And um, I expect us to be a bit more mirror image of what pitch book does. So, you know, 12 and a half multiples to 15 multiples are not uncommon with the companies that they're reporting because the multiple is less important as, as is the intrinsic value of the company. And maybe it'll be an acquisition uh, someday, but they're getting a market valuation on their securities that enhances their bargaining power with future um, you know, large purchasers. Is there a minimum limit? Is there a minimum limit that they have to sell in order to qualify? So this is now inside of our rule book. Um, there will be, <laughs> uh, but I, I, until we publish the rule book, I, I'm not being evasive. I just can't commit. Um, but there will be. Yes, they, 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 we will not have. Um, generally, we will not have companies, with rare exception, that are in quote unquote prototype phases. Uh, we, we have to have a, an organization that is making sales and has a, a completed product. It's not so early stage that they're in development. Now, there will be industry pools that we're creating, as, like the old New York Stock Exchange had market specialists. As we develop the exchange, we will be developing the market specialist pools. There, we do plan to do a, a biopharma market specialist pool. The parameters for listing a biopharma company will be different from a Midwest manufacturing company um, because they have, they have a longer wait. And each company, this is the beauty of the new law. We can customize the listing for each company. So what about what about the proportion of stock sold? Is there going to be a minimum, like less than ten percent of the of the stock would not qualify for a listing, or In, there isn't? There, there is. There are. Go, there's going to be corporate governance restrictions, and there's going to be much more extensive rules on uh, insider availability. Rule sixteen is going to be much more extensive. So. The responsibility for running the company and 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 holding periods and uh, lockup periods, there'll be significant restrictions on the owners of the company to avoid pump and dump um, and to avoid the abuses of what is the over the counter market. So yes, there will be minimums, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's interesting. So, um, so who are the competitors of of this stock exchange? I, I presume this law is not. Uh, you know, you don't have a monopoly on, on uh, operating under it. And uh, there are other players here that try to take advantage of it or may have even lobbied for, for it to happen. Yes. What do you see out there? So um, right now we're aware of one direct competitor and we're collaborating, believe it or not. Uh, and that's the NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. So the NASDAQ has, has collaborated with us. Uh, they've lobbied for the law side by side with us. Um, the, the reason that they are so willing to work with us is we, we barely overlap on what we're contemplating for size of transactions. They're going to go after a transaction. I think their minimum is going to be 50 million and up. So we're our sweet spot spot and our labor obviously, and our profitability will be lower <laughs> um, because it's going to take more work to do transactions that have lower volume. So, but the NASDAQ is very interested um, and very supportive. We've met with the other uh, exchanges and the, the, so for example, the Sh Chicago Board of Options Exchange, um, they don't even have rules that allow them to do any IPOs at this moment. So they're actually quite interested because our marketplace might make it easier for them to develop their own listing platform. 
So the NASDAQ controls about 80% of all new IPOs every year. And the, the New York Stock Exchange is really the other 20%. Mm -hmm. um, so our direct competitors are actually not necessarily even other stock exchanges, but like you alluded to earlier, it's go, go venture or entirely stay with a private equity firm mm -hmm. or a venture firm um, and, and, or a hybrid. So our, our, we don't have a lot of competition. It's a very, very new uh, concept. Uh, you know, we were the pioneers in this. So, you know, there's an old saying, um, the pioneers get the arrows and the settlers get the land. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for you. Exactly. And we are the pioneers right now. So we're suffering through creating it. So, um, so, okay. So this is starting and you don't really have much competition other than the private equity funds. Um, what are the weaknesses of, of this concept? So surely, you know, there's always pros and cons. What do you see as potential weaknesses and how are you planning to overcome them? Yeah, there, there, there are a couple of I, what I consider to be major weaknesses. And I, I think they can all be captured under a single umbrella. And that is uh, creating the confidence in something new. Um, like creating the education and understanding of how it will work. Um, so it, it will be early adoption. And our, it, our strength is we have a great educational program and we have a great team and we're building state-of-the-art facilities. So it, the more we can educate and build confidence in the marketplace, the more we'll see investor migration and, and companies willing to list. Um, if we're not able to really build confidence in the marketplace, uh, then we, you know, this isn't entirely new. You know, the Toronto Venture Exchange um, did not do a good job of building investor confidence. Um, they, and they did not do a very good job of building stringent rules uh, for investor protection. So we can live from their mistakes and we're creating an environment where investor confidence in what's being reported and in the liquidity, as that goes up, we'll succeed. And if the investors are not confident, um, they, won't, they won't come to the market. The other, I guess, underneath the weakness is that we're really uh, reliant on the success and the, the um, you know, of each individual listing. So if we get good listings, um, one, one of my early clients was a commodities trader and he made millions and he, he taught me this lesson the capital and liquidity follow the yield, not the other way around. So if something is making good money and it's expanding in value, investors wanna get in. So we're concentrating on companies that will have potentially very high yields, both as dividends grow and, and, and profitability and earnings grow, but as well, and more importantly, as the valuation of the firm grows. So those so, are our weaknesses. We have to develop the market. Got it. Um, that's, that's understandable. And what about, uh, the timeline? So do you already have companies that are about to go public on your exchange or, or how do you see, uh, this uh, really starting up? Um, yes and yes. So we, we do have, um, we, we have a, what we consider to be a social media, uh, website we developed called DreamX Connect. There's about a thousand, uh, profiles in DreamX Connect right now. And we're still a year from launch. I would say that there, there's fewer than 50 of the companies we're dealing with that are in that environment that I would say are close to uh, ready for listing. Um, the good news is we do not require 4,000 employees like the NASDAQ. We can operate it in a very streamlined environment with, with you know, to be a profitable exchange without a, a needing 2,000 listings as our, as our launch. So in the venture market, I'm suspecting that if we have 50 good listings uh, when we launch, uh, and it's very much, you mentioned the, the London, so the alternative investment uh, yeah, the aim. Yeah. markets there. They have about, um, I think they have close to 1,000 companies. They've been around for 25 years. It's a very difficult market for, for them. Um, 
the, this type of venture investing is not something that is, is favored in the London markets. They come to the United States. So I think we're going to have a bit of an easier time uh, with the entrepreneurship spirit of the American uh, company. And uh, I think we'll get more listings than that faster. We'll grow to many listings. And the nice thing is it's always a residual revenue for the, for the exchange because once we have 50 in the following year, we have another 50 and another 50. As we build the pool of, of liquidity and trading volume, uh, we'll, we'll be more successful in the venture markets. So it's going to be critical, I guess, that the first offerings are going to be successful because yeah. if you had a failure at the beginning, that would be really difficult to overcome, right? Yeah, and that, that's, that goes back to what I was saying about confidence. It's, it's interesting because I've been, in, I've been going to Congress now for five years, and there are certain congressional leaders who say, you have to protect the investors. Uh, the, the, we want stringent protections. Um, and uh, that's going to be very hard for you because the investor protection obstacle is high. And then I get the, I leave the Congress and uh, I get the investor perspectives, which is, you know, you really have to have something that I see is going to be very valuable. I'm willing to take risk, but we have to know that, uh, you know, the firms are going to be growing very fast. So you know, it's sort of like, the, it depends on the audience I'm speaking to. One person is more interested in, uh, you know, slowing down the investment opportunity because they're worried about people losing money. I mean, the reason the Securities Exchange Commission exists is investors lose their money. If no one ever lost their money, we would need no regulations. <laughs> so there's a validity to that. The other side is the investors are, they're hungry. They have an appetite for investing in uh, companies that will grow in value and appreciate their stock price. So we have to balance those two things. And I think we're doing a very good job of that. Certainly the Congress has reacted well. We had unanimous consent. I don't know if you can appreciate that um, 435 members of the Congress voted yes for this bill two years ago. We, we had COVID and the problems. It's not passed only because of that. But you know, to get a Republican and a Democrat to agree that water is wet <laughs> is, is a difficult task, but we have fairly bipartisan unanimity support for this is a necessary market in the American public because they, all the solutions Congress can come up with involve putting a burden on the taxpayer. Yeah, no, that's definitely sounds very special. So what do you suggest if uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm growing my company, I have 20 million sales revenue, I make some money, uh, how do I go about exploring this uh, opportunity? So, so today, the, the first great step that everyone seems to be taking is going to DreamX Connect. And we have a menu-driven profile of the company that already begins the process. And they, it's actually a bona fide social media. So we have investors, we have intermediaries, they have their own profiles and begin the process of, of exploring the communication so that you can met, like, like LinkedIn, the companies can search for investors and intermediaries, the investors and intermediaries can search for companies even today. We've had successes even before we're open. Um, uh, one company just had found a strategic investor, um, their management teams married up nicely, they're gonna get some money and that's okay with us. It's, we earn nothing for that, it's a free website. Um, so the first step today would be get your profile in and begin talking with our senior management to see what are the necessary steps you'll have to take between now and launch to prepare yourself if you're truly interested in, in getting listed. What if I want to keep my privacy? I want to you know, explore whether it's even feasible for me to be there. And I don't want to let the whole world know that I'm thinking about this before I know that it makes sense and I really want to do that. Well, that, that's what Jurimax Connect offers. So. There is no requirement on DreamX Connect. Uh, you, the company has complete discretion as to how much of the, po of the information they populate. So if you just wanna have your website and certain uh, industry characteristics and keep everything private, fine. Um, as you go along the process, if you realize, oh, this is really gonna be for me, at that point, they will be in, and this is 
after launch, they'll be in the confidential um, cycles, exactly like the public markets. So, you know, the emerging growth companies are allowed to file confidential documents to test the market. And we will have exactly the same feature. It's just a feature available to a small company that is not available today because the way the small company tests the market is they have meeting after meeting after meeting with private equity firms <laughs> to to do valuation discovery. Well, we're offering that opportunity in confidential filings so they can test the, the pricing and feasibility of an offering without committing themselves to opening the world to all of their, uh, uh, all of their reported information. And who's going to help them with that? So are there investment bankers or is it you guys that will kind of look at these companies? Who's going to give uh, expert guidance on, uh, on this? So it can be all automatic, right? It's not all AI. Right. So, so the answer is yes. <laughs> um, so we're working in conjunction with different interest groups. Um, there, are, there are securities lawyers that have formed certain groups that are willing to, um, at, at reduced fees, provide services. It, it's a nice way for them to get clients. Um, we have accounting firms that are pioneering that we've had discussions with. So what will happen is we will become kind of a centralized marketplace to help direct and create the relationships for the small firm that they currently don't have. Mm -hmm. um, that does make the pricing a bit variable, but see the nice thing, you know, it's a bit like, I don't know if you've had a car crash, you go to your insurance company and they know who the people repairing the cars are and they can police the market by saying, Oh, this firm did a very bad job and we can internally begin the process of saying, well, we really can't send um, any of these prospective listings through, you know, some particular law firm that is, that's not doing competent work. We can actually say that without slandering anyone say, well, here's the track record of these people. Here's the track record of success of these right. folks. So, um, that's been very favorably received by all of the intermediary marketplace, especially um, the smaller brokerages that really are concentrating on private placements that don't have the cachet of Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan. They're, they're very interested in being part of this intermediary pool to reach for, it gives them expanded liquidity. They don't have to raise yeah. up the money themselves. So yeah. there's a lot of intermediaries helping right okay. now. Okay, all right. So um, that's that's great. Uh, that's good news that they will have access to, to the experts. Before we wrap up, I have one more question. You, um, you mentioned on your profile um, that uh, you're hoping that this new stock exchange is going to help minority uh, owned companies to also uh, raise money. What do you have in mind? How do you think it's going to help them? So we are, we're, our capital group, the, the ownership structure of the exchange is going to be 60% minority owned. Um, and we have a, a particular relationship in the minority community. My M&A advisory firm was one of the key advisors to the Chicago Urban League's entrepreneurship program. And so the minority um, capital markets are, are very, they're, they're weak. Um, actually, this is all you have to do is put the news on today and everyone's trying to flow money into that community, but there isn't actual mechanical help happening. Mm -hmm. So there's a, plenty of people willing to put capital resources toward investing in a minority owned firm, but we are actually working with the Urban League right now to create an agreement. We intend to open what I consider to be a retail type office space, consultive office space, right in the minority communities so that the better companies can actually come to us and they may not have the relationships to reach to, um, you know, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, yeah. but they have brilliant ideas. I probably have, I probably have about 10 eligible minority owned companies today who could list at our launch. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. So I really look forward to that. 
so if someone would like to learn more, uh, obviously uh, DreamX Connect is a good place, I guess, for, yeah. for companies to go to. If they would like to reach out to you or learn more about, you, you know, about the Dream Exchange other than the Connect website, where do they go? So on our website, which is dreamx.com, it's mm -hmm. D-R-E-A-M-E-X, um, there are information channels. So if they want to get in touch with a senior executive, there's a link. If they want to find out more about the Main Street Growth Act, there's a link. Okay. Um, if, if they want to go to DreamX Connect. And, and then there's just info at dreamx.com. So that informational uh, email request, if they send an email to info at dreamx.com, uh, senior executives from our company answer those emails and we open the dialogue with, whether it's an investor or um, whether it's, it's a new company, we're very prompt in developing our, our relationships. Okay. That's very good. So thank you, Joe Sekala, founder and CEO of Dream, the DreamX Exchange, where you can IPO your small company. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, really enjoyed having you. And for our listeners, stay tuned for next week. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. This was the Prof Serve Traction Podcast with Steve Prada. To learn how your professional services or technology business could break through the ceiling with EOS, visit TractionEquity.com. <laughs>